Hi everyone, it's Janice from the Divorce and Religion Podcast. Did you know that it costs me money to produce each episode of this podcast? I really appreciate your help to keep my show on the air and helping other people. Please join me over on Patreon, where you can also find commercial-free episodes, and the links are in the show notes. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, welcome to the Divorcing Religion Podcast. I'm your host, Janice Selby. I'm a registered professional counselor and a religious recovery consultant. I am excited and deeply honored today to welcome to the podcast fellow Canadian and award-winning author, Margaret Atwood, whose work has been published in more than 45 countries. Margaret is the author of more than 50 books of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels. Her latest novel, The Testaments, is a co-winner of the 2019 Booker Prize, and it's the long-awaited sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, now an award-winning TV series. Margaret's other works of fiction include Cat's Eye, finalist for the 1989 Booker Prize, Alias Grace, which won the Giller Prize in Canada and the Premio Mondello in Italy, The Blind Assassin, winner of the 2000 Booker Prize, The Mad Adam Trilogy, and Hagseed. Ms. Atwood is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, the Franz Kafka International Literary Prize, the Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Award, and the Los Angeles Times Innovators Award. Together with her late husband, Graham Gibson, Margaret was also awarded the Nature Canada Award for Conservation Advocacy. And in a way, I have environmentalism to thank for bringing you to the Divorcing Religion podcast, since you and Graham got to know my husband, Paul Hamill, through your shared love of birds. So welcome to the podcast, Margaret Atwood. Very interesting podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, I got to just settle myself here for a moment. I I actually wrote down some questions um, today, which I usually don't do, but I want to make sure I don't miss anything and the reason I reached out to you in the first place is because the demographic that watches and listens to this podcast uh, is a vulnerable demographic and a courageous demographic, because many of us escaped the clutches of fundamentalist religion, fundamentalist thinking in many forms. So my background was uh, Pentecostal, but I work with people who've come out of every um, fundamentalist background you can imagine. So when The Handmaid's Tale came out as a TV series, it was just incredible. It was almost overwhelming. It felt so familiar to me, and I knew that I wanted to reach out and talk to you. Thank you for that work. You are welcome. <laughs> I wonder if you would tell us... Um, a little bit about what your childhood was like. Okay, I grew up uh, with um, the scientists, uh, but both of my parents, being from rural Nova Scotia in, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, of course, everyone belonged to a church because those churches were the community centers. So I would say before paved roads and automobiles, uh, every one of those little conglomerations of people, and they were often very small, uh, had a church of some kind that they would go to, and often there would be several in the area. And um, that was where the young people's, the young people's societies did their um, social gatherings, and uh, people would meet at the church every Sunday, and if somebody in the community was ill, you heard about it there, and uh, major casserole. Um, so they were, they seemed to be fairly benign. I don't, I wouldn't call them cults. They were, mm -hmm. uh, they were what you did uh, in those communities. Yes, and so, even your dad, being a scientist, he still participated. He was brought up a Baptist, okay. as far as I can make out. Um, but he, you know, brought up. He, they were so rural that they were even more rural than the rural. They were, they were very backwoods. Mm -hmm. uh, but a certain kind of Nova Scotian backwoods. Everybody read. Yeah, uh, they had a little one-room schoolhouse, and uh, they got a weekly newspaper. So you know, this was this was not. Um, uneducated rural poverty. In fact, I wouldn't even call it poverty. If if you had a house and you had a cow and you had some chickens, 
um, and you had a tractor, you were living um, off your land. Mm -hmm. And especially if you had a river nearby and you caught fish and, and eels, eels seemed to have been a thing. Wow. Uh, <laughs> so he was very into self-reliance. Right. Um, as you might imagine, so he he had all he had that skill set. He wanted a piece of furniture. He would just build it. He built our houses, the wow. ones in the woods, um, and he he was always very handy in those ways. He mm -hmm. knew how to do physical stuff, and that was a good thing because he was a field biologist. So if you're going to go out into the woods, you needed to know how to behave there. <laughs> that's why that's the truth so you wouldn't get yourself killed yeah um, yeah so i grew up with that background my mother's family had been um, methodist in the days before the um some of the presbyterians and the methodists got together and formed the united church of canada so i think for the early part of her life it was methodist and then then it was united church and they were fairly social-minded, um, fairly benevolent. I, I always say fairly because, of course, there's always going to be some people who were not. Mm -hmm. And I did encounter some of those later. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that particular community that she grew up in was, was pretty um, lacking in cultism. Okay, <laughs> so we did that's it good. That way, yes. <laughs> by church was something you did. Mm -hmm. It wasn't something that tried to take you over. Well, it didn't need to because it was the only fun in town. <laughs> and uh, wow. I told wow. my mother a joke when she was quite old. Shall I tell you this joke? Please do. Yeah, people. People were sorted according to what um, denomination they belonged to, as you know perfectly well. Oh, and they had views on each other. <laughs> they had views. Okay, so the joke is the, I mean, the worst thing you could say in the valley at that time was, he drinks. Oh. You know, drinking was really, that was right right outside the fence. Uh, so the joke is that a man is getting a tour of hell, and he goes to the first room and devil in charge is by his side and he says and the people are being horribly tortured and he says what did, who are these people and and what did they do uh to deserve this he said well mm, they're the baptists and he said what did they do he said well they danced so we go on to the <laughs> next room and and the tortures are even worse he says and and who are these well these are the presbyterians and what did they do? They laughed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and they go on to the final group. And the tortures are worse than either of the other two. So well, who are these people? These are the Anglicans. And what did they do? So, they used the wrong fork at dinner. <laughs> so, so, I told this to my mother, and she didn't even crack a smile. She said, that's about right. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> so you can see the Anglicans thought themselves socially superior. The Presbyterians <laughs> were viewed as pretty doer and without a sense of humor. And uh, the Baptists, although they had pretty good choirs, um, were thought of as, as killjoys. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know in our house, we sometimes would refer to uh, the Presbyterians and Methodists as the chosen frozen, because, of course, I grew up very <laughs> Pentecostal, very, <clears throat> yeah. me, very charismatic. So, right. um, so then was was uh, religion present in your home then when you were uh, growing up? Did you religion go to was, Sunday services? Yeah, religion was a surround. Um so people in the States can't quite understand this. Because of the way Canada was put together at Confederation, they had to deal in the Catholics. And uh, there are two school systems in Canada, and you can choose which one of them you pay taxes to. It's going to be on your tax return form. And one of them was the Catholic school system, and the other one was the Protestant school system, which is now pretty secular, I have to say. I don't think they got any much, anything much at all. Um, 
But we did in our, our generation because it was still the Protestant school system. So you got prayers in school. You got Bible readings in school. Mm -hmm. um, you got, you know, hymns in school. I mean, it was, it was, it was just all there um, in a sort of generalized Protestant kind of way. And I'm not sure what the Catholics were up to, but one of my informants says that their hymns were quite sucky because uh, they were basically outlawed in England until the 19th century. So they didn't have those 17th century pretty strong hymns. They had these sucky uh, 19th century <laughs> ones. <laughs> that's that's from someone who was there. Um yeah, so it was all around me, but but we didn't do it. We we did pagan festivals, by which I mean Halloween, Christmas, and and Easter. Yes, all basically pagan in origin. Mm -hmm. um, I was very puzzled by the Easter bunny. It was male, but it had these eggs. Where did it get them? <laughs> it is confusing. <laughs> yeah, was there a Mrs. Bunny? And if so. Why was it laying eggs? Because being amongst the biologists, I knew that bunnies didn't lay eggs. They laid little bunnies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was all pretty confusing. But nonetheless, there was the Easter bunny. And um, Halloween, of course, was my favorite, as it is the favorite of many. And um, it dates back to a very interesting uh, pagan festival. It is originally the night when the dead returned. That's that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can still find this going on in Mexico, Mexico quite a bit on the Day of the Dead and right. different, different practices for different areas. But uh, some people make a little path to their house of marigold petals, and that's so the dead people can come to your house for mm -hmm. dinner. Mm -hmm. You cook up what they would particularly like. And it's also so they can go, can go back to the graveyard when that day is over, because it's all very well to have them for dinner, but you don't want them there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> that certainly so sounds like some in, house guests. And all of those things. And <laughs> as a teenager, I went around to every single religion I could get my hands on, including the spiritualists, to find out what went on there. I wanted to know what they were up to. It was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, and as a, a nine-year-old, I I elected to go to United Church Sunday School. My parents were worried about that. They didn't think that, that it was good to indoctrinate children. But I just wanted to find out what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they were doing mostly was discussing wardrobe items with the teenage Sunday School teachers. <laughs> <laughs> or as I can figure out. So this was not your basic cult. This is basically a lot of backsliders. <laughs> However, mm -hmm. I did win the uh, Bible Passage Memorization Prize. Mm -hmm. And I also won the prize for the best temperance essay about why you shouldn't drink. Would you like to know why you shouldn't drink? <laughs> I bet you could tell me. <laughs> Illustrated. Yeah, you shouldn't drink because... <laughs> <laughs> because oh when you drink, the uh, corpuscles in your nose enlarge. And then if you go out into the snow, you're likely to get a frozen nose. It, you don't want that. No, no. I, I do not. <laughs> I think that's a pretty good reason. <laughs> I think so, too. And that doesn't surprise me at all that you won the prize for uh, Bible memorization or for or for writing, of course. Um, you had so many... Uh, verses in the different things that you've written, you come across yeah. as someone who is very well, well versed. Well, there, we, we continue on in time. Uh, so this, the religious presence continued through high school. We, it was still the Protestant school system. And then, of course, I went into um, English language and literature, four years starting with Anglo-Saxon and con continuing right on up to T.S. Eliot. Well, you can't understand a bunch of it unless you know what they're talking about. Um, so then you had to learn theology, you had to learn about religious disputes, you had to learn about which passages of the Bible they were riffing off. Mm -hmm. uh, 
a number of people have been pretty interested in the book of Job for <laughs> a very good reason. Um, and you you have to you have to have a grasp of um, religious history, particularly as it applied to England, but then the background, of course, takes you right back to to the Bible, and you have to know the basic stories. And one of my um, profs there was Northrop Fry, who, as you probably know, was a big name in Bible studies, and um, not only wrote a couple of pretty thick books about it, but also gave a class every year, which was audited by a lot of people. They, like People flocked to it, called mm -hmm. the Bible as Literature. Um, and wow. there is a book called God, a Biography, which basically takes the same approach. So this is a book, and therefore, what kind of book is it, and who's the hero of the book? Well, the hero of the book is God, <laughs> mm -hmm. mostly about God, and how do we know? Um, there's a lot of secondary characters, as you know, um, <laughs> but how do we know about about central characters or any characters that are in books. We know about them through what they say, what they do, um, what other people say about them, and how other people react to them. Mm -hmm. um, so these, both of these approaches, Fry's and God of Biography, um, look at the Bible as a piece of literature following the rules of literature. So one of the reasons the Bible has continued to be so um, thoroughly read is it's got a lot of scandals. and It does. <laughs> a lot of scandals and action in it, mm -hmm. uh, as well as, you know, some <clears throat> nice thoughts and um, other things, and a lot of complaints. There's a lot of complaining, particularly in the Psalms. Why? Why is this happening? To, why me? <laughs> yes, well, quite a lot of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So, so I just had to know that because you couldn't make your way through English literature without knowing it. You mm -hmm. needed to know it. And that was in uh, in high school and college, or was that pretty much? So you know, uh, identify the years for you. High school would have been nineteen fifty two to fifty seven before you were born, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> college would have been nineteen fifty seven to nineteen sixty one, and then I was in graduate school, the nineteenth century, a century of religious crises. Mm. Uh, and you, again, you you can't understand. Uh, a lot of what they're talking about, unless you understand these crises of faith that were happening in that century. So so that's how come I know so, so much about it. Plus, I would much rather uh, spend my time with the Gideons in a hotel room than with the <laughs> crap television that you get there. <laughs> it's so different, the whole idea of um, simply looking at the Bible as literature rather than the pressure that I grew up with and a lot of, um, say, my clients or my demographic grew up with, where we were taught that it was absolutely literal and, you know, it was it was God's Word. It's still literal uh, and in action today. It's inerrant. There are no mistakes. And so when you're taught yeah, that as a, a child— have a lot of problems with that approach. Oh, because yeah. it wasn't originally the Bible. Right. Uh, before the invention of the Codex book, which is a bunch of pages with a spine, and therefore you have to have an order of the pages, mm -hmm. uh, it was scrolls. So it was the little books, and you could read them in any order, sort of like the work of Pessoa, the Portuguese modernist. Up to you what order you read them in. But once the Codex book comes along, they had to decide what was going to come first and what was going to come in the middle, just like a novel. We all have this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and what was going to come at the end. So they decided the order of the Bible then because there was a change in technology. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Uh -huh. As you know, changes in technology can have a lot to do with changes in the way people think. 
And once you had this beginning, the middle, and the end, God a Biography has got a sequel called Christ, A Crisis in the Life of God. <laughs> and the crisis was, here are these amazing prophecies, including Isaiah, which, as you know, is very um, inspirational and very wide in scope, like the whole world, and uh, and then it didn't happen. <laughs> It did not happen. And instead, uh, Rome takes over um, the land of Israel and behaves badly as it tended to do. Mm -hmm. And and so what what happened to these prophecies? How come they're not coming true? So several different explanations. One, because we've been bad. Um, but but two, well, we're just moving the whole thing to the spiritual plane. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, we're not going to talk about, you know, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel or any of that. That's, you know, we're, we're going up to the kingdom of God, which <laughs> is within. Uh, so that puts it on a whole new footing, <clears throat> as you might ex really does. expect. And <laughs> then, of course, along came, comes St. Paul. Uh, probably the architect of the Christian church as we came to know it, because Christ would never have called himself a Christian. <laughs> right. <laughs> would not have been in the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, many more than Marx would have called himself a Marxist. Right. right. The founders are never uh, called by the name of their worshipers. Mm -hmm. So... So he then takes what had originally been a cult within Judaism um, and abolishes a number of the rules, like we're not going to worry about kosher anymore. Right. right. You can eat pigs. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and and picks up a few features from, from pagan religions and makes it possible for all kinds of people to join this. Otherwise, it would have remained pretty small, if if at all it had remained, uh, mm -hmm. within Judaic beliefs. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, I'm wondering... So you, you want to go this... back to the origin of the uh, figure who, who dies, goes to hell, comes, comes back. That is very deeply... Um, embedded in Middle Eastern religions other than Judaism. It goes all the way back to Anana's descent to hell and the cult of Dumazi, the dying and reviving shepherd king. Sound familiar? Wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Of course, the Egyptians were, the ancient Egyptians were very big on um, dying and returning, mm -hmm. but but very uh, centered on certain physical practices like your brain in a jar. What can I right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. So then when did you, um, the, of course, the, the book that I'm most familiar with of yours uh, is Handmaid's Tale and then, of course, The Testaments, which I'm so glad I read. It was so satisfying and beautifully written, and I got a little emotional at the end, had a little cry at the end. It was just a beautiful, wonderful um, sequel. Uh, so when did you start thinking that you wanted to you wanted to write about this? So the um, Handmaid's Tale, a lot of religious people or ex-religious people think it's about, you know, that it's putting down um, religion, but it, I yeah. wonder, it's actually more authoritarianism That's that right. you're getting at. Yeah, so the, the first question that I asked myself was, um, and remember this is at, in the late 70s and early 80s, if the United States were to become a totalitarianism, mm -hmm. what kind of totalitarianism would it be? Well, it would not be, hi, I'm a communist, uh, join my group. That that would not happen. Mm -hmm. You you would never be able to get the numbers for that to pull off any sort of successful coup d'etat revolution or, or takeover. Uh, and it would not be, um, although this is a bit debatable, hi, we're, we're broad-minded liberals and we're going to create an authoritarianism. 
based on that. <laughs> it's a bit of a contradiction in terms, mm-hmm. although not these days totally out of the question, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the, mm, quotes, progressive people are sounding a bit authoritarian to me. Right. When you're so looking at cancel culture and stuff. All that off. Well, well, yeah. I mean, it depends how, how far to the extremes people shove each other. Mm-hmm. Because once these things get rolling, of course, there's an, there's an impetus to be purer than pure and more French revolutionary than revolutionaries and more communists than communists and more Christian than Christians. And, and it becomes a bit of a pissing contest to see who is the most worthy and virtuous within that group of people. So, um, and then, of course, you have to um, stone to death or shove off a cliff anybody who doesn't fit your definition of goodness, truth, and purity. But mm-hmm. but you're doing it for the good of mankind, don't you understand? Oh, wow. Yeah. Like Any that. cause can be a holy cause. You betcha, just about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and once you have a dogma, you also have heretics, and then you get to burn them at the stake and wow. all sorts of fun for all. Right. Um, so in the 70s, we have a lot of uproar. We have a lot of uproar. We have second wave feminism. We've already had the civil rights movement. We've had riots on campus in the 60s and uh, summer of love, mini skirts, birth control pills, just all of these newfangled things, um, which have upset a lot of people. So then in the in the seventies, you even get a lot of laws being changed, like women can have their own credit cards. Shocking, <laughs> very shocking. <laughs> um, and then we get the election of Ronald Reagan. And that's when the religious right in the United States starts to be weaponized politically. Right. Mm -hmm. So I always listen to what people say they're going to do should they have the power to do it. So it's, it's not a good idea to just dismiss those things because if they get the power, they will do it. People thought Hitler was just funning when he wrote Mein Kampf. No, he meant every word of it, Mm -hmm. as we shortly came to see. Um, Yeah, so I thought, okay, what what are these people saying they would like to do? (laughs) Let's see how that would play out in real life. So, modest dress. (laughs) You can never accuse a handmaid of not being dressed modestly. Mm-hmm. That's why they've been so, so successful when they've cosplayed in state state legislatures. First of all, they're silent. They're not saying anything. So you can't kick them out for creating a disturbance. And secondly, they're very modestly dressed. Mm-hmm. They're just sitting there. Uh, but because we live in an age of television, everybody knows what they mean. Yeah. Like that. Okay, so I built... I I built my Gilead from what people were saying they would do should they have the power and what kind of totalitarianism the United States would be if it were to become a totalitarianism. It would be a religious totalitarianism as you now see people attempting to enact. But it would not be um, religion in its more benevolent form. It would be um, religion used to coerce other people. So what you're seeing in the States right now is a battle between that kind of thinking, which is 17th century. Countries usually go back to their roots. They go back to their roots, and the roots of that kind of thinking in the United States are the Puritans of the 17th century. So you can have a good look at what they were saying and doing to see what kind of outfit this would be likely to turn into. And let us just keep in mind that the Puritans expelled or killed people who did not fit their religious dogmas, Mm -hmm. including Quakers. They were Quaker hangers. And they were not very nice to indigenous people either, Mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's, that's where it comes from. It's not all religion is bad. In fact, 
uh, religion within oppressive systems is often a personally uh, encouraging, hopeful, and sustaining force. Um, but that would be the the core parts of the teachings of Christ, not the enactments of the uh, church in the 17th century, mm -hmm. just for instance. Right, yeah. yeah. So how do people behave when they get power? Usually fairly badly. <laughs> yeah, and and, you know, the former guy in the United States is telling exactly what he plans to do if he makes it back in uh, to office. Well, the first thing he will do is is purge the Republicans. So mm -hmm. if I were them, I would read up on the Night of the Long Knives. Wow. Yeah. So that's the next thing he's going to do. Mm -hmm. oh Get rid gosh. of anybody who is not a complete foot kisser of him. Right. Yeah. And probably the Supreme uh, Court then, too, because he wouldn't like the well, word Supreme have to there. Kiss the toe. Yes. <laughs> that Exactly. Wow. So you, uh, and also you used examples. If but, I, but if don't I don't believe for a minute that he's religious in any way. Oh, no. Because he isn't. And no. uh, this would just be a straight out totalitarianism with a lot of papering over um, by somebody who holds the Bible upside down. Yes, I remember. <laughs> yeah. What is that usually a sign of, dear? <laughs> ignorance if no no know. witchcraft <laughs> oh that yes that's right upside down crosses yes oh gosh um and so did you use i remember reading that you had um you had done research you didn't want to put things into that book didn't into put anything Tale in that were just you couldn't just out. make stuff up right there had to be a precedent in human society um in the past or in the present for each thing. And the television series has followed that. So before putting something in, they have to find um, a part of human history where that was done. Wow. Okay, so you probably, if you saw the um, the episode in which they're drowning people. Okay. Okay, so that's from the French Revolution. <laughs> oh. Anyway, each of these things has got a precedent. In other words, none of these things are things that human beings would never, ever do because they would never, ever do them and they couldn't even think them up. Uh, we've done it all mm -hmm. one way or another. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so for the Testaments, what had was it in your mind previously to no. do the sequel, or was that because people were writing to you after the TV show and saying, what happens? Yeah, they were writing to me after the novel and saying, what happened? Yes. Um, so, and, I, and are you going to write a sequel? And I always said no, because I thought, you know, that's it, I finished. Um, and things seemed to be moving away from that scenario in the 90s. Okay. The Cold War is over comes down in 1989, and then we are just, history is over and we're all going to go shopping. But that didn't happen. <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, first thing we get is the Twin Towers event, mm -hmm. and that unsettles everything. And then we have the financial meltdown of 2008, which unsettles a lot of other things. And then we have a little interregnum, which we'll call the Obama years. But during that time, people are just getting more and more worked up, and then they then they vote in Donald Trump. So around that moment, actually about a year before that, because I watch TV, and I can tell when somebody's got a good TV manner. And Trump had a good TV manner in those years. I don't think he does anymore, but he did then. And I thought, okay, this is a real possibility. So so what then happens? And I started writing it then and was writing it, was thinking about it when we started shooting The Handmaid's Tale in the fall of 2016. So about, about the end of August, we're shooting it and shooting it. And I saw Ann Dowd enacting Aunt Lydia. She's so good. Um, and then we have the election and everybody wakes up 
everybody connected with the show wakes up that morning and says, we're in a different show. It's not that the show has changed in any way. It's, the scripts have not changed. It's the same thing. But the frame around the show has changed. It will be viewed differently. It will not be viewed as, ha-ha, a light fantasy. Oh, this will never happen. It was viewed as, here it comes. Mm -hmm. That's how people then saw it. Mm -hmm. So that's the sequence of events. So I was writing... Um, Testaments in um, 16, 17, and 18 gets published in 19. And it was just a wonderful book. I can't say uh, enough about it. I want to thank you for writing it <laughs> because I really, really loved it. Well, that's um, wonderful. And we recently um, read uh, your book also that I think was turned into the the Massey Lectures, Payback Debt and the Shadow Side yeah. of Wealth. Yeah, um, so that was the Massey Lectures. The The process is in re goes in reverse in a way. Okay. So the, the, the mandate is you, you write the book, then you condense it down into the lectures, <laughs> and then they condense those down a little bit more into the radio broadcast. But you have to write the book first. So that's why I, I refused to do it for many years, because it was too much work. <laughs> too much work. Yeah, it was a lot of work. Uh, but again, you're probably thinking of the chapter um, about uh, balancing scales, which, of course, comes into religion a lot. Uh, why does it come into religion a lot? Because it's it's part of being human. We We think of... If there's been an injustice, there should be justice. Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody's done a bad thing, they should have to account for it, atone for it, or pay for it in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, so we all have these little scorecards in our heads. You know, their Christmas present was pretty shoddy this year. <laughs> I gave them. A <laughs> we all do it. It's just a thing that we do. It's built in. And so, of course, it gets into religion. And um, they're re all religions have what happens to you if you've been bad uh, and what happens to you if you've been good. I, I don't think they would function with, without that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's the finer points, what counts as being good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's that's when the thumbscrews go on. <laughs> Oof. Yeah. That's when, you know, certain people get hold of that power and do not want to give it up. They want mm -hmm. to be the one saying what's good and what's bad. Well, I wondered uh, after uh, we went through that payback debt and the shadow side of wealth, I wondered which you fear more, the dangers of religious authoritarianism on society and politics or the dangers of corporate greed on the environment? And I know oh, some of my yeah, listeners I'm are not, wondering, I'm too. I'm not limited to those. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, okay. So, and and I think they often go hand in hand. So, mm -hmm. if, if you look at who who are the big donors um, to the people who want to impose themselves as religious arbiters, uh, they're often people who've made a lot of money, of course, out of um, corporate behavior. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you know, it's it's power. Power on any level. So you make a big hit in Silicon Valley, get a bunch of power and money, and then it's just irresistible. You you have to throw it around. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. Uh, yeah, so that's it. And, and I think the United States was so successful for so many years because there were checks and balances. There were limits. And the French Revolution went pear-shaped when those limits came off. Mm -hmm. uh, and they enacted some pretty squirrely laws. Uh, in other words, they went too far, and then people reacted against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely have been wondering in the United States since they overturned um, Roe v. Wade. Like, it's been surprising to me. I thought maybe that would lead to some kind of revolution or something, but I think... 
maybe the heat hasn't been turned up high enough well, yet. And I know some people are reacting and responding yeah, and pushing for change. Yeah, you haven't been change. following local elections. The, the uh, anti-abortionists have lost about 80% of them. Uh, and often in places that would surprise you. Mm. I think it was Kansas, was it not, or was it Oklahoma, uh, where they put it they put it um, on the ballot, and people voted against it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad. So they might be all for different other kinds of things you might regard as as right wing, but they're they're not in favor of that. Excellent. So as far as I can tell, it is um, it's against the American Constitution which says freedom of religion. Okay, freedom of religion, you shall not impose your religion on anybody else. They had to do that because there were so many religions there already. They were mm -hmm. never going to get a consensus unless they put that in. Mm -hmm. um, so the anti-abortion thing is based on a belief in the soul uh, mm -hmm. and the belief that the soul is present in a cluster of four cells. Abolishing abortion is you re imposing your religious belief on everybody else. And why that is not against the Constitution um, escapes me, because I think it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. It's a, agreed. It should be a personal choice. If that is your belief about the soul, don't get an abortion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But forcing everybody else to adopt your belief is against the Constitution. Do you think we're in similar danger um, in Canada? No. Why? We've got six political parties. <laughs> <laughs> That's it's terrible. not so polarized because mm -hmm. um, there aren't just two poles, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. It's, mm -hmm. it's not oppositional like this. It's, it's more scattered. Uh, I think you might have some you know, generally um, more liberal-minded people and some generally more conservative-minded people. But there's there's a lot of splits within those camps. Uh, and essentially anybody who gets in as prime minister of Canada always has that problem. And it would not be any different for, for Pierre, person whose name I can't pronounce very well, Oh, right. <laughs> How were we Polyev. supposed to say that? Mm -hmm. Polyev? <laughs> yes. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. he hasn't even presented a platform yet. He hasn't told us what he would do. It's yeah. just been oppositional, which is pretty easy. Right. It's governing that's hard. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You got that right. Um, we're getting down to our last few minutes. I wondered what people, movements, or technology give you hope for our collective future? Uh, well, we did a program last year called Practical Utopias. Yes. Because most utopias, in fact, all just about all, um, have gone pear-shaped pretty quickly. Either they weren't practical enough and they didn't know actually how to do the growing of the wheat or whatever it is they were expecting to live off. Um, or they got taken over and, and turned into totalitarianisms pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So I give you Joe Stalin. Um, I give you the Night of the Long Knives, courtesy Hitler. That that was when he obliterated the other wing of the Nazi party who still believed in the socialism part, mm -hmm. national socialism. He got rid of them. Um, and it was, then it was just going to be him, which it was. So, so how do you keep a utopia from going bad? And how do you make it practical enough so that, number one, it's carbon neutral, carbon negative, number two, it's scalable, that's financially possible for people to do, and number three, attractive enough so they will wish to do it? So we had um, teams, I think we had eight teams, all of whom were given these problems to work on. And they came up with some pretty good things. There was one thing that they shied away from. One of my questions was, are you going to have a police force? 
are you going to have a police force? Uh, what are you going to do about people who don't agree with you or who like break the rules flagrantly and, you know, beat up other people, um, steal, murder, and all those things we don't like them to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't really want to think about that very hard because, of course, their society would be so great that nobody would do those things. Right. <laughs> That's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, no. <laughs> no, not yet. It is not. So I'll just toss into the conversation a book I'm reading right now, which you would probably find interesting, called The Goodness Paradox. And this is a primatologist and evolutionary bi biologist saying, who is right? Is it the Rousseauians who said people are naturally good, pure, and, and noble, and they get corrupted by civilization? Or is it the Hobbesians who say that people are naturally depraved and, and violent and they need to be controlled by civilization? Wow. So he goes into this in some depth, including his theory about how we got to be this way, and says, essentially, it's both. Mm -hmm. We are both. Mm -hmm. uh, so the... The Muslim idea that you have a good angel sitting on one shoulder and a bad one on the other one, both of them whispering into your ear. That's kind of observed human nature. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have the capacity to be both. Anyway, you'd find it interesting. Yes. And um, the goodness paradox. Pertinent to any discussion of religion, because, of course, the good angels, it's pure, noble, inspiring, and supportive. The bad angels, it's controlling, mean, and and abusive, and and uh, cruel. And it can be both, of course, because mm -hmm. we are both. Wow. Yeah. And we have to take responsibility for ourselves. And that is something that uh, can take a while for people to learn. It's very attractive when you're, when you're entrenched in fundamentalism. You don't have to think for yourself because you well, see the black and white. That's right. Yeah. So I'm sitting right now in a, in a house that was not a fundamentalist house in the original sense, but was the home of a cult for a number of years. So these things don't have to be traditional religious. They can, mm -hmm. they can be just as culty uh, yeah. under some other title. But the structure tends to be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. So a charismatic leader, a number of seniors who are the enforcers, and a number of followers who get bossed around quite a lot. Yeah, and often are, the followers are people with really good intentions. Oftentimes people who want to save the world. They want to Without see a doubt. things better. Yeah. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. Uh, but unfortunately, it is often the case that the, the leaders turn that those good intentions um, to their own profit and benefit, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So true. Not always, but pretty often. Mm -hmm. It's so tempting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, to have that kind of power. Well, this has been um, such a delight getting to talk with you today. And your website is Margaret Atwood. .ca. And yeah, on your website, there's, yeah. yes, okay, and there's practical utopia information on there. Uh, and also, I think uh, you've got information on there about the master class, because you have given a master class in, uh, in writing. Correct. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I have a sub stack in which I'm writing right now about the French Revolution. Oh, my gosh. Coming up, part two. I went off to see the movie Napoleon. Oh, yeah, was it good? Well, I thought it was. Okay. Very good on very good on the hats. They were spot on <laughs> with the hats. I <laughs> love it. Okay. It also well, has that moment that was made people gasp in which he he didn't let the pope put the holy Roman em emperor crown on his head. He took it and put his on on his own head. Oh, oh, oh. So cheeky. Um, Yes, very cheeky. <laughs> well, uh, Margaret Atwood, you are a national treasure. I'm so delighted that I got to chat with you today. Thank you very much. Thanks for the incredible uh, 
work that you have done through your writing and through your also um, conservancy uh, efforts, you make Canada and the world a better place. Thank you for joining well, me today. Of course, I have the best intentions. <laughs> Okay. Uh, right, just like everybody. Mm -hmm. So it is much easier to manipulate people through their good intentions than through their their evil ones. So who wants to join my cult and be really, really <laughs> evil? That that does happen, but it's not um, the norm. <clears throat> I'll have to think about that. The Margaret Atwood. You want to join my cult and be really, really <laughs> evil? I'll, I'll join you. I'll be your number two. Oh no. <laughs> Well, then, because you're really, really evil, you'll try to depose me. <laughs> you'll do a coup d'etat. Yes. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Hopefully we can wear the hats, too. <laughs> okay, okay, it's been a pleasure, and good luck with everything. Right. And I bet you have a lot of listeners. I or, bet I will after this episode. <laughs> so well, you probably you already do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we're working on it. Okay, everyone, thanks for joining us today. It was my delight to interview author Margaret Atwood. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.